Howdy guys, John Crowder coming at you again this week. I told you guys at the beginning of this year, I feel the Lord's really wanting to return our focus to Christology. Now I've done a couple videos on this subject over the past year, but believe me, it is a joyous, intoxicating, and inexhaustible topic. So I want to talk about high Christology a little this week. You know, by far, the biggest question of all theology is, who is Jesus? And this is the topic of Christology. Not even what he's accomplished or what salvation entails, but who is this man Jesus in his very person? There are a wide spectrum of beliefs under the umbrella of Christianity. Both mainstream and marginal ideas, they all have their place and a full scope of our biblical understanding. And many would consider me a marginal voice, even though I would consider myself rather orthodox. And while marginal voices have their place to help us see things in a different light, when formulating our ideas on something as foundational as Christology, we must always give more weight to the consensus view on the matter because all of our Christological understanding was arrived at through a complex process of debate, discussion, and deliberation in the first five centuries of the church. The church fathers thought this was the most important and vital aspect of all. And while there may be a consensus view on some matters, on others they're not, like atonement or sanctification or the work of the Spirit. And although these are by no means small or irrelevant doctrines, the early church was focused more than anything else on the question of who or what Christ was. How is he different from ordinary humans? Was he just some divine entity that appeared human, a spiritual or angelic being, an enlightened man who showed us how to be fully realized spiritual people? Or is he both God and man in the same person? Not just a hybrid of the two, but fully God and fully man together in one. Such a matter of the incarnation is quite a mystery because it presents seeming contradictions. He's both omnipotent yet impotent, omniscient yet limited in knowledge, omnipresent yet contained within a human frame. See, the early church fathers did not think matters like atonement or salvation as separable concepts that could be carved away from the person of Jesus. In fact, his work and his person in the Incarnation are considered two aspects of the same seamless whole. His Incarnation as the God-Man was part of his work that culminated at the cross and resurrection. Everything else flows from who he is. And you know, the other thing the early church spent nearly as much importance on was defining the doctrine of the Trinity, because it intrinsically deals with the nature of who God is. Holy Spirit didn't become incarnate. Jesus was not just a remarkable human being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit testifies of Jesus being the incarnate Son of God. The Trinity is three persons of one essence. But we won't dive into all that now. Modern critics will point out that the political maneuvering among church leaders in those early Christological debates, man, they were bitter and petty at times. There were many men who were misunderstood or misrepresented. And we can't deny the politics and infighting involved in any of church history. But a conclusion can be right, even if there were arguments and human positioning going on in the midst of arriving at that conclusion. Even if politics and posturings were involved, it says nothing about the truth of the outcome. And though human motives may be suspect, the right result can still be reached. If we toss out the importance of who Jesus is, just because his followers were pricks at times, we would be left with nothing. In fact, we must wonder if God himself would permit his body to reach such a mistaken understanding of something as vital as the person of Christ in these early ecumenical councils. I mean, surely if Holy Spirit's real, he's going to help guide us in something this big. Even in our darkest times, we must realize that Holy Spirit has moved in the church to pull her back from error. And trust me, Mother Church has believed some of the dumbest stuff over the centuries. 
but in this matter we must trust providence. So the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, it clarifies to us the most basic and foundational understanding of Christology. For starters, they say Christ is one person and he has two natures, one divine and one human. These two natures are distinct and they have their own integrity. They are not mixed together or confused like a, a demigod. Now granted, there is still some mystery in this because it's not all fully defined, nor could it be. And depending on your metaphysical worldview, people can look at it all sorts of ways. I mean, what is a nature? And if you really want to get existential, then what is a person? <laughs> but essentially, we can say that Christ has one of whatever goes with the person and two of whatever goes with the natures. Now, this is a mystery to ponder. But when we realize who he is, only then can we begin to sort out anything whatsoever about his work. Because a certain sort of saving work requires a certain perspective of Christ's person. To know that he is other giving love. To know that he is almighty God, capable of accomplishing something on behalf of humanity. To know that he is the seamless union between God and man. This should tell us something about his work in seamlessly accomplishing a union between God and our own humanity. Now, throughout the development, of theology. There have been different views on Christology, primarily low and high views of Christology, and there's some gray areas. You could say a middle Christology. Now, a low Christology does not require him to be God. He's just a religious leader or a moral teacher that we're called to emulate. And then there is middle Christology, in which Jesus is the source of some saving benefit other than himself, he either provides a God consciousness or some sort of spirituality to others, but he's still more of a bearer or a vessel of that goodness, a guru maybe. But he does not have to be fully God in a middle Christology. He's just a prototype of sorts. And his work consists of restoring his own relationship to God and then maybe influencing the rest of us after it. But you see, only a high Christology provides both a high view of his person and an elevated view of his saving work. It holds to the truth of the New Testament texts, which bear witness to Christ as being God and even receiving worship. It recognizes that only God can accomplish what he accomplished, and he did it single-handedly. Only God can reveal to us who he is. He didn't just send a prophet. He stepped into our humanity to fully reveal himself to us. And only God can save us from sin. And only God can properly deserve worship. And thus Christ is the proper object of our worship because he is the self-revelation of God and he is the Savior of the world. The importance of Jesus does not rest in some life-giving spirituality. He is not merely a fully realized spiritual human being whose saving work consists of restoring a spiritual relation to God, either in his own case or influencing us. No, he is not just the bearer of some saving benefit other than himself. You see, to take the focus off of his person and onto some influential God consciousness that he carried is at best an emaciated Christology, if not an utter abandonment of the gospel. No one else will ever be God incarnate or die for the sins of the world. Jesus is an exclusively unique person, and he accomplished an exclusively unique work. His saving work on the cross is a holistic expression of who he is. And Jesus accomplished something in his death that his life would not have achieved without it. The cross is the locus of the world's reconciliation with God. Jesus did not merely exemplify how to be ethical or spiritual as the exclusively unique Savior who is both fully God and fully human in one person, Jesus single-handedly accomplished expiation, exchange, and participation in the divine life on behalf of all humanity. What do I mean by that? In expiation, he bore our sin and he took it away. He was our substitution. I don't mean penal substitution where he was fending off an angry father. No, he was your substitute in that he died so that we might live. 
He is our exchange. He gave his life and holiness in place of our darkness. And he is our participation with God because through our union with him, we are made righteous. The divine became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now, you know, modern liberal theology is notorious for taking a de facto approach of low or middle Christology. The focus is heavily placed on Jesus' social ethics, social justice, nonviolence, etc. In other words, he just taught me how to be a good boy, with a main emphasis on how we should live, rather than Christ himself being the main point. You see, for these guys, a Jesus-driven life is really more of just a Girardian socialist-driven life. And while some middle Christologies would have us participate in Jesus' spirituality, only a high Christology would have us participate in Christ himself. For middle Christologies, there is no real mutual indwelling of Christ in us or us in Christ. And that's only found in high Christology. Those middle Christologies, they may speak of presence, but it is not Christ himself. For middle Christologies, Jesus is unique, but he is not exclusively unique. For a high Christology, he is exclusively unique because he is unique in kind. He is materially decisive for our salvation. No one else will ever be God incarnate or capable of saving the world. So Jesus is absolutely indispensable. Well, the early church, they clearly had a high Christology. But this began to change a bit, quite honestly, after the Age of Enlightenment, or what's called the Age of Reason, or the Age of Analysis. Secularism and humanism began to cast major doubts on the person and role of Christ, as well as the inspiration of Scripture. And much of this was in reaction to the blind superstition and repression and violence of the religious culture of their day. And philosophers, they wrote God out of the picture altogether as this knee-jerk reaction to the abuse of the church, which assumed that it was the absolute mouthpiece of God in all the world's affairs. And so atheism abounded. Philosophers like Immanuel Kant shifted society's thinking to a non-Christ-centered focus. Now, yes, he is imminent within our world. He became one of us. He is determined to always be one of us in the incarnation. And yet he is utterly God. He is utterly transcendent. And so the goal of of the Christian faith is just not only to have a, a, a higher estimate of humanity, but to be absolutely awed and enthralled and in worshipful adoration of God himself. And look, granted, society was sick of religion for a good cause, but the answer was not blatant humanism. So following the Age of Enlightenment, a theologian named Schleiermacher came along, and his attempt was not altogether bad because he tried to find a balance between Christianity and the philosophical, rationalistic culture of his day. He attempted to breathe some new life into theology by making it palatable to the secular worldview. And around 1800, he introduced what would eventually become liberal theology. And there were a slew of German theologians who followed in his trail in the 19th century. But all of 19th century theology would eventually sort of succumb to this most basic error, that we can discover God by rationalistic, intellectual, theological means, that our human understanding can eventually give way to faith. And these guys took for granted that a rationalistic Greek reason-based worldview is somehow the source of truth by which we must gauge the scripture. But in fact, human understanding does not lead to faith. You cannot discover God. It doesn't go from Adam to Christ. No, he had to step down and reveal himself. It goes from Christ to Adam. It is first faith that begins to even open our eyes of understanding. That was a big point made by the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, who kicked against this liberal theology many years later. But over the course of the 19th century, theologians attempted to deconstruct everything that smacked of the supernatural, the mystical, the theological approach of form criticism, or what's known as higher criticism of the scriptural text that came into fashion. 
Now, I, I don't mean criticizing man's interpretation of the text. We need much more of that. No form criticism was concerned with demythologizing the text, reframing the scriptures as merely man's thoughts about God. 19th century theology was essentially an attack on scripture, the supernatural, and eventually even the deity, resurrection, virgin birth of Christ, and all in the name of trying to reach a cultured, rationalistic society. And so often, in our attempts to be relevant, we need a little more irrelevancy because we have a message that is not of this world. But what were they reaching with society at this point? I mean, they had cut off their own nose to spite their face. And all this evolved into, you know, guys like Marcus Borg and the Jesus Seminar, which was like the full blossoming of this stuff, where even the New Testament letters were just discarded in this search for who was the real Jesus behind the scriptures. And look, you're not going to find him. He's only the Jesus of the scriptures. And this all came as a progressive development throughout the 1800s of questioning the inspiration of scripture, the authenticity of even the existence of Christ. I mean, call me closed-minded, call me a fundamentalist caveman of an uneducated supernaturalist, but buddy, here I stand that Christ is the word of God, and yet the holy scriptures are still the very words of God that testify of him. I will question our interpretation of them all day long, but I will not question their validity and inspiration in themselves. I am not a blind inerrantist that claims there are no scribal errors in the text, but I am not about to write off passages that I simply don't like or disagree with. In all their attempt to make theology socially acceptable, most of what 19th century theologians did was to make it more irrelevant than ever before by discounting the very thing they claimed to believe in. Now, sure, they would push Jesus' ethics a bit, but it devolved into just existentialism. I mean, for Schleiermacher, Christ in the scriptures were not even so important rather than the feeling of religion, which was the whole point, which is complete subjective lunacy and a middle Christology at best, and the things that most charismatics get accused of. <laughs> Again, I don't mean to truncate or completely ignore a whole century of theology, okay? I mean, I'm not writing all of liberal theology off. It has its highlights, okay? Marginal voices have their place. But anyone taking a low view of Christology is at best a marginal voice. We must be centered and rooted in the joy of the incarnation because Christ has single-handedly accomplished what we never could in our moral, ethical, or spiritual striving. It is only thanks to our participation in His holiness, which He has single-handedly achieved, that we can even live morality or ethics anyways. <laughs> and not just because He demonstrated how to be holy or ethical, but because He is our holiness. He is our righteousness. He is your union with God. God could no more take His Spirit from you than He would go back on the incarnation itself. Love you guys. Bless you guys. And hey, check out these amazing amazing announcements that we have right now. While I was praying, somebody touched me. While I was praying, somebody touched me. While I was praying, somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. Somebody touch me, glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me, glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me, must have been the hand of the
Hey guys, you may want to keep these announcements a secret, but the deadline is coming up for our Indonesia mission. Already you should see the caliber of this team of crazies that we have coming. It's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be a lot of drunken glory. Our Kana staff is coming on this one. Tony Sai, Rod Williams. If you want to join us, the trip is in November, but you need to sign up by August 15th. Also, just to let you know, I'm going to be in the UK for a tour of the UK and Northern Ireland with Minstrel Godfrey Birtle. It's going to be wild. We'll be in Belfast September 2nd and 3rd, Edinburgh September 4th and 5th, Leeds, England September 6th and 8th, and London September 8th and 9th. I will be in Gibraltar for a mystical school the weekend of September 25th, and then Louisville, Kentucky for a mystical school the weekend of October 9th. Then we have our East Coast Mega Grace Tour with Tim Wright playing music. That'll be in Toronto. Toronto, August 21 and 22nd, Maryland, October 23rd through 24th, Massachusetts, October 25 and 26th, Alabama, October 27 and 28th. Then I'll be in Shelton, Washington in November, and then we have a December tour to Australia and New Zealand, several cities down under, and in January is our Norway Mystical School. We've moved it from Oslo to beautiful Bergen, so come join us on the coast there, and then I'll be in South Africa for a tour to three cities in January, and then in February, I'll be in Oklahoma City and New York City, and also, don't forget, this fall. Our Cana New Wine Seminary is finally going online so you can get hammered drunk on the gospel with some of the best speakers on the planet from your living room starting in November. Visit Cana.co for details and you can be a certified drunken theologian. Love you guys. We'll see you there.